If you don't find joy and Christ in your suffering, your suffering remains the same. Is when you get to the end of this life, if you have turned away from God, there's no glory and joy to be had on the other side of it. Same amount of suffering here, far worse result on the end. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today, and we pray that this message speaks to you, encourages you, and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. Um, Happy New Year, everybody. It's good to have you with us today. So glad you could join us here at PAX. Um, I'm really excited for this year. We will be going into more than one book in 2024. Uh, If you were with us much in, in 2023, we spent the entire year in Hebrews. Uh, up until Thanksgiving. And so <laughs> we, we this time are going to start off with James or as, uh, I, I don't know if Mandy said it from the stage. You didn't say it. Uh, that's okay. Um, uh, in prayer, I threw everybody off because I pointed out that James's name is really Jacob. And um, actually it's uh, Yaakov because uh, there's no J in uh, Hebrew or in Greek. And so the languages that the Bible was written in don't even have the right, uh, don't even have the letters that we use uh, in English as we translated them. But um, as we get into this, I want to start off just by uh, reading this and the, uh, this first verse of James. And I want to talk about James a little bit. And then uh, I think this message will be a good way to help us kick off our year. Uh, as well as, you know, the beginning of talking through James. So James 1, verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, like I said, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to read out the entire thing in Greek, but, uh, James's name in the Greek text is Jacobos. Uh, which is, like I said, Jacob. It, it's an iota, an I, and then uh, alpha, and then I'm going to stop trying to remember what the names of all the Greek letters are because I haven't gone through it in a while. But anyway, if you were to like transliterate it in English, it'd be I-A-K and then a W thing that looks like an O, a big B-O-S, Jacobos or Jacobos, uh, Jacob. And, um, but the... You take Greek, and then if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with history, maybe this will all be new. If you're familiar with church history and such, then this is going to sound very redundant and reductionistic. But um, in, it, this was written in Greek because that was the language spoken at the time, and that's who was controlling Israel at the time were the Greeks, and then in the Romans uh, who spoke Greek. Eventually, Rome moved to Latin, and so then everything was taken from Greek into Latin, and then from the Latin we started getting more and more uh, you know, languages sprouting out from that, and a lot of English influences, a lot of those languages are founded in Latin, um, uh, but English is kind of a random melting pot. Anybody who's gone through any sort of English grammar knows that um, our rules don't make any sense because we used about 40 different languages to figure them out. So, uh, But in this, um, it, there, er, in this, there's no... J. And so even Jesus, his name is Jesus or Yeshua. Um, it, it, depending on if you're looking at the Greek, it's Jesus. And then that same name would be Yeshua in the, um, in the Hebrew, and which is Joshua, the way we normally translate it. So it's really our Savior, Josh Christ, uh, more than. <laughs> um, and, and then this guy is um, a little more into his, uh, his intro here. This is kind of a crazy first line. Can we put verse one up again? So James one, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's Jesus' little brother. James is Jesus' half-brother. They say half-brother because the Holy Spirit conceived the baby inside Mary. So he only has one human parent. So by Joseph fathering other children with Mary, then they're only like half of 
Jesus DNA. It's kind of a weird uh, theological concept there, but James is the half-brother of Jesus. Since Mary was a virgin and was not yet married when Jesus was conceived, any of his brothers and sisters must be younger than him. And uh, depending on the church tradition that you hold to, some people are real adamant that Mary was like an eternal virgin and they were just like adopted or like cousins who were like brothers. And there's no reason in church history or in uh, the text to assume any of those things. Um, But uh, James is Jesus' little brother. Now, I just want you to think, who's got siblings in here? Okay. What would it take for you to believe that your sibling is the Messiah? Like, like I remember what a significant moment. And now, granted, like Paul says in in one of his letters at one point, he goes, I am the worst of sinners. And and I feel like I can really identify that uh, with that when I talk about uh, my, when I look back on my childhood and, and really up till I was like, 19, um, with the way I treated my brother and sister. I'm the oldest of three and my brother and sister, I, at one point, um, I was a kid, but my brother was five years younger. And so he was a much smaller kid. I actually kind of punted him down the stairs at one point. Like I was not a nice brother. I don't think I ever broke a bone, but I did get mad at him playing Tony Hawk pro skater. And I punched him really hard in the arm trying to give him a dead arm, but I kind of dislocated his shoulder and he ended up getting shoulder surgery about 10 years ago, um, which was like 25 years, 20 years after it happened. But I mean, like I was a pretty mean, pretty bullying older brother. I was not nice. That is a confession of sin. I'm not saying you should be like that. Uh, I'm saying there's grace and the Lord has transformed me. But for For my, and I'm not saying Jesus would have been that kind of older brother. He would have been a a perfect older brother, which in some ways is just as bad to deal with. Like, why can't you be more like your brother? Like, are you kidding, mom? (laughs) He's literally the son of God. What do you want me to do with that? But to go from those kind of dynamics that are just inevitable in the comparison, in the being around, in the like, oh yeah, sure, we have this perfect, like everyone thinks, you know, they have the one golden child, like we literally do. It's not me, right? To grow up in all of that, to be convinced. It says when Jesus went back home in the Gospels, when he went back home, there was so little faith. They wouldn't even let him do any miracles or healings. That He was only able to heal a few people because nobody would trust him and come to him in faith to let him heal and pray over them. I I mean, like, even his entire hometown rejected the idea. They just looked at him and went, isn't that Joseph's son? Isn't he the son of the the carpenter, the construction worker? Like, he's not the Messiah. Josh, the construction worker, is not the Messiah. That's definitely not it. But he was. When God got a hold of me and Jesus transformed my life, my, I started bringing my little brother when he was in high school, I started bringing him to um, a Bible study for college students. And um, then I remember one night as I was, uh, we were chatting kind of behind the car, even though we were getting in the same vehicle, uh, we were just standing behind the truck like you do, talking in the parking lot because, you know, and, and he just kind of opened up saying like, man, like no matter how bad you treated me, like I always looked up to you a little bit, but like, it, it just, like, I felt like somehow it was my fault that like, it never, you know, and, and it, our relationship was so hard and I wanted it to be good. I wanted to, you know, be acknowledged and, and loved by my brother. And I, I feel like that was so difficult and, and the way you treated me made that so hard but I see what God's doing in you and I want that. And and I'm excited that not only that you're being saved, but also that like we can be friends and that we can have a relationship. And that broke me. But the amount of transformation that had to occur for that conversation to be able to happen, knowing how people in general received Jesus, it's a pretty significant miracle and testimony of who Christ is that his little brother becomes one of the pillars of the church. So James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't appeal to the fact that he's Jesus' brother trying to claim some sort of nepotistic leadership here. Everyone knows that he's the the, the pastor over um, uh, in Jerusalem and then um, speaking to 
so many believers who have converted to the faith, who have received Jesus as their Messiah. And so then we have to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So this is specifically written to a group of Jews who have been scattered. It's known as the diaspora, which it just means, you know, it's like uh, plants when they sprout out all their stuff. Uh, you know, they send out all the seeds or the spores all over, um, you know, like a mushroom, except fungus sounds like a weird way to describe the church. So, uh, but but it, it's that kind of thing that um, in uh, the various times that Israel had been conquered, one of the results that kept happening is like, if you read, if you read through the chronological Bible plan with us this year, you'll get to it eventually, where Israel is going to be conquered multiple times, and they will be sent into exile. They will be sent all over the place. They keep getting kicked out of their land. They're taken away as slaves. They're taken away as captives of war. And uh, sometimes they just, it's so brutal where they live, they move somewhere else. And so there are Jews who are starting to live all over that region of the world. And James is looking probably mostly a little bit north and west around the Mediterranean and maybe south and west as well. Not so much east. I mean, they, they were heading east as well, but in general, the, the dispersion was largely around the, uh, this, these places in Asia, Asia Minor, you know, like where Turkey and Iran and all these places are and down around toward Egypt and everything else. Eventually, we have a major church uh, in Alexandria within a, a century or two after this. Uh, and and then, of course, all the way around to Rome, which is in Italy, which um, I don't know how familiar with geog geography you are, but that would uh, put it um, you know, halfway across Europe. James is writing to Jews who are believers. The 12 tribes is an indicator that he's talking to the Jews, the 12 tribes of Israel. And he's not writing to Jews who are not saved yet. He's writing to Jewish believers, not discounting anybody else, but just in general, writing toward them. As far as timing goes, if you were with us a couple of years ago, or if you've read through the book of Acts, then you'll know that Paul went on a lot of missionary journeys throughout his life and was probably, Paul was probably executed sometime in the late 60s. And James probably wrote this in the early 40s. So this may have been before a lot of his mission trips, before a lot of his, uh, before a lot of Paul's missions. And so Gentile churches may not have been as established at the point that this is being written. This might be pretty early in the faith if Jesus was crucified and resurrected around the early 30s, 30 or 33 AD, depending on how much the calendar got skewed when they brought it around to kind of reset the starting point at the birth of Christ which I'm um, dropping all sorts of random Easter eggs that I don't know if this is <laughs> how easy this is to follow if any of this is new to you. Uh, but you guys with me, more or less? Yeah, we're good? Okay, cool. So, so anyway, a decade or two after Jesus, here's James writing this to Jewish believers who are kind of all over, and the word is spreading that the Messiah has come, the, the one that they've been waiting for. And so as he's writing to them, Jacob, or James, as we'll just call him James, okay? Because that's what's printed in your Bible. But James writes this, and, and I want to read through it, and then we'll kind of process back through it. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you phrase... Phrase. Okay, words... Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even, when they go about, even while they go about their business." 
Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil, desire, and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. That's what we're going to process through today. There's a lot in there, and there's a lot of stuff that gets twisted, and I'm going to try to be passionately firm on my understanding and teaching of this without being too disparaging. But man, there's some bad teaching that comes into the church through some of the things that James says in this passage. And, and I, I'm, I'm con- confessing to you now that it is my desire to say this in a way that maybe somebody who has heard it or believes it to be some of the false ways that I will um, kind of challenge here, um, that you might receive that with grace. And... Um, I'm trying to get back to my notes because I have a lot of stuff in here uh, to go through. I'm trying to remember where I'm supposed to stop and that type of thing. So if you ever want to follow along, we have notes in the Bible app most of the time. And (laughs) today we do. So um, same app where that reading plan is. But, okay, let's uh, start back up at the top here. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And now, having just read through it, you've heard the word trial a bunch of times and you've heard the word temptation a bunch of times. They come from the same root. So trial and temptation are closely related, if not just variations of the same thing. When you face a trial, this is not talking about like a legal trial where you stand before a judge and that kind of thing. This is talking about things that test your faith, things that cause you to question what you're doing, the hard things that come against you where there is an opportunity or temptation to look for an easy way out. That's a lot of what James is talking about as he starts this off. We're going to get back into that toward the end of the book, but that's going to be like two and a half months away. <clears throat> But he says, consider it joy when you face trials. Not, man, I hear you and that's really hard. And like, gosh, why doesn't God show up? And if you've been reading the reading plan with us right now, like Pastor Mandy said, we started off in Genesis. We got right past the flood and the Tower of Babel. And then before we get into Abraham's story, we break out and we jump into Job. And we're going all the way through Job. And there's like 42 chapters of that. So it takes a minute. Uh, It's going to take us a couple of weeks to get all the way through that. And in that reading, man, Job, like his life was going great. And God's like, Job is awesome. He's like my favorite dude right now. And then everything gets taken from him. And he just has these crazy long, it's like 35 chapters of Job arguing with his friends about why he's suffering. And then all of a sudden God shows up and he's like, hold up, none of you know what you're talking about. Job, when he first encounters his tragedies, says, even though he slays me, yet will I praise him. Even when his wife goes, you should just curse God and die. I've seen the joke that, you know, that was the, uh, that was Satan's worst judgment against Job was leaving his wife there. Took everything else, left his wife because her whole thing is she looks at his situation and goes, you should curse God and die. Like, that's rough, man. Like, she doesn't even have your back on this. It's kind of a joke. (laughs) My wife's giving me a look. I'm not saying that all wives. I'm just saying, at the, in particular, I think she's here listening to Satan more than God in that in that uh, opening scenario there. But Job's initial response is praise, even in the midst of that, even when everybody's telling him, "You should just curse God and give up on this whole thing." His response is praise at first. Read through the book with us. He goes on a bit of a journey. Unanswered grief will do that to you. 
It's a rough time. But James says, hey, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy or complete total joy. Consider like, and, and there's an echo of like what we read in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, when it says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, embraced the cross, that he, he looked forward to to what the suffering that would come and, and the suffering of the Messiah, God who is man in flesh, the Messiah suffering on the cross for the sins of all the world is a level of suffering that no human can ever possibly attain to. It's not just that crucifixion is one of the most horrific ways that we've come up with to execute people because in the Middle Ages, they did a much better job of making it way more painful and gruesome. It's not that that was the worst death ever come up, ever invented by man. It's that on top of the brutality of that execution, he's taking on the sin of all the world and paying the penalty when he had no sin of his own to account for in that scenario. And so there's that so many layers of intensity and depth to what Jesus suffered on the cross. When we face trials in all of this, we should look at this, pers- at this through the perspective of Jesus embraced the cross with joy. We should look forward and have a joy, not a happiness, not a just like, I'm just going to keep smiling, don't Pollyanna everything, but have a joy that carries us through, a knowledge that this is only going to last for a short while. And the longer we spend in eternity, the less and less our suffering will count. The smaller percentage that'll be. The longer we go into eternity with Christ, the smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, more insignificant that suffering will become. Not to minimize how much it hurts now. And that's why James is digging into it. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And so the more, and so that same thing, this testing, this examination of your faith. And it, it's not to say like testing as in, um, it, it's, it's testing in a way for the purpose of approval. Uh, the way to phrase this is escaping me all of a sudden. But it, it, it's not testing like you have to pass a difficult exam. It's more like you, it's being tested for the purpose of approving it. And so like in, in this testing, as, you, as your faith is tested, as you are walking through life and there are scenarios that give you opportunity to turn away, you have the opportunity to turn to God each time. Will you be Job or will you be Job's wife? Will you turn to God no matter what is coming your way and say, and yet I praise you, Lord, because you are good. And I know when this is over, I'm still gonna be with you. But if you turn away from him in those times, If you reject the Lord in that pain and suffering, not only does that suffering still continue, it's like, um, yeah, there's a a meme joke going around that's a a little crude, but really funny. Um, It says, if if you don't find flatulence amusing, you're missing out. You have way less humor in your life, but the same amount of flatulence. (laughs) If you don't, if you don't find that amusing once in a while, then you're skipping out. But the same, the, the other part of it's the same. You still have to deal with it. It's just whether or not you're finding, you know, a moment of hilarity in it. If you, if you don't find joy and Christ in your suffering, your suffering remains the same. You don't turn from God and have less suffering. Where, where it really shakes out as a different result is when you get to the end of this life, if you have turned away from God, there's no glory and joy to be had on the other side of it. Same amount of suffering here, far worse result on the end. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance, long suffering, the ability to, to walk through and, and sustain. And, and as so many have gone before us and through intense pain and, and are able to look back and say it like, like, not only do I see Christ more and more deeply as I've struggled through this thing, um, 
You know, so many have suffered with long-term chronic pain or, or disability or, or, or illness. I've said, I find Christ more and more deeply in this pain and suffering. But then they're also able to turn that around and, and in their own perseverance, share encouragement with others that like, hey, you know what? God will get you through this. He's getting me through this. And at the end of this, I know where we're headed and it's glorious and there's no more of this. And that's a pretty incredible place to, to land. And so he's, he's saying, let the perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete. And that he's speaking of the, the process of uh, sanctification, which is never fully complete here, but it's moving us toward that. And the closer we get to it, the better. The more we are moved toward maturity and completion, the better. The better it is for us, the better it is for our witness to this world, the better it is for the church that we're, the body that we are involved in, the better it is for everybody. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. That feels like a little bit of a hard left. Yeah? Like, hey, let the perseverance bring you completion and everything. By the way, if you lack wisdom, go this way. Like, now it's starting to feel like Proverbs where it's just like dropping one-liners, you know? It's like, like sometimes if you read the book of Proverbs, you picture Solomon like writing on like strips of papyrus, and, you know, and just like kind of tossing them around. And at some point a scribe came along and collected them all and like put them in. It's like, I don't even know what he was talking about, dude. Like these ones are all about wisdom. Put them there. You know? But James is still on topic. Consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds. That's our thesis statement for this section and maybe for the whole book. But for this section, Consider it pure joy when you're facing trials. So in the midst of your trial, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Ask God and it will be given to you. If you lack wisdom on what to do, if you are suffering and you are looking for how do I manage this? How do I deal with this? What's the best way to get through this? Seek God. Don't just look for the easy way out. I mean, the, the most like clear and extreme version is like the idea of torture, right? Like somebody, like they know that there's a limit to what humans can deal with. And so they know, like people who do that to other people know that there's a limit. And at some point you will break, you will give in, you will finally give up whatever. And so like even, you know, for special forces, military, whatever, they train them how to withstand as long as possible or how to give up things that might distract or, or get them through it and out of it in, in various ways but they know that at some point it's going to break you. But there is, when it comes to the temptation to seek ungodly means for delivering ourselves from our pain and suffering, there is never a scenario where we have the green light to abandon God and to reject him and turn away from him. If you lack wisdom on how to manage this in a godly way, whatever crisis, whatever pain, whatever suffering you're facing, if you lack wisdom on how to get through that, seek the Lord. He will give you the answer. You might not like the answer, but he will give it to you. That is a promise given here by James filled by the Holy Spirit, writing this to the church, sending it out broadly. Hey, people, as you are out there suffering, and this is written to, again, people who are not in Judea anymore because they've been conquered and taken away as captives or they moved out because of persecution and where they live, they face persecution. And now, even as people who are Jewish facing persecution in other lands. On top of that, now they are Messianic Jews. They are Christians who have become followers of Christ, the Messiah, which split Judaism. All these people who've been following the same God, the same faith for centuries, millennia at this point, now faced with this separation where some of them go, hey, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified in Jerusalem recently, he's the Messiah. And a whole bunch of them going, absolutely not. We should kill that guy for saying it. And so it's like a persecuted people and then like the persecuted subsect of those people. It wasn't a very popular idea to be a Christian. It wasn't very popular to be Jewish. And then it was less popular to be a Christian. When they're suffering, when they're going through whatever it is, 
If you lack wisdom, ask God. And then he says this, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Wind. And here we run up against one of those things where people will often take that and twist it and turn it into a, <clears throat> you're not saved if you have any doubts. And that is such utter nonsense and such a toxic twisting of the scripture. That's not what James is saying. He's talking about asking in faith. And he's saying, essentially, if you're just giving lip service to God, he's not interested in just showing up for you just so you can have like your magic genie that you like rub the bottle, get the thing, and then move on with your life as if God never happened. If you ask in faith, he will respond. He will give this. But if you just ask like, well, I don't know, like let's try Jesus today. No, no, that's not how this works. And what I've seen, I remember being on, um, I'll get just a little um, uh, charismatic on you guys for a second. I remember being um, uh, with some people who um, we threw out some pretty crazy prayers uh, for some people who were kind of questioning the faith. And we were just like, all right, you know, we're praying that God would show up in a crazy way that you would know that he is God. And as they were seeking him, they found that he showed up and he did something pretty incredible. And I, I saw it happen a bunch of times. And a couple of times after that had happened, those same people who like, man, they came back and they were like, that was awesome. God totally showed up and this thing came through and it was exactly what I'd asked for. And it was amazing. We're like, yeah, praise God. And they're like, do another. And when people said that to Jesus, he said, no, I'm done. What you get next is the sign of Jonah. And they're like, what? And he's like, tear down this temple. I'll rebuild it in three days. And they're like, I don't understand. He was like, good. And he walked away. He didn't even like explain it to the people he said that to. He just left them while he was on the cross. They're still mocking him for talking about tearing down the temple. Like, I mean, they're, no idea what he was talking about, some of these people, because they weren't interested in really knowing. And there, there was a moment there where some of these people who had had this like real flashy kind of way that like, God showed up, I believe, I'm into Jesus now. And then he didn't show up the next time. They just tried to like rub the lamp and get the next miracle. They were like, well, now what? My magic genie in a bottle didn't work. I got Jesus in a bottle, I rubbed, uh, nothing. Nothing. Because that's not how Jesus works. He was trying to introduce you to himself and, and, and start a relationship. And it, I mean, it's like the, you know, equivalent of like, hey, you know, first time I showed up, I, you know, go on a date and I, I bring flowers and I do all this thing. We go to a nice meal. And then, you know, like after a while, like I don't show up to my house every single day with a dozen roses and, you know, like a nice dinner out for Mandy. I mean, you know, I guess if you got that kind of money, sure, why not? But at some point, there's got to be something more to the relationship, right? She didn't marry me because of the flower choices. There had to be something more to that relationship. If you're not interested in the relationship, like the flowers and dinners ain't going to get it. If you're not interested in knowing Christ, you don't just keep getting all these free miracles. He's not here to deliver you into your own stupidity again, into your own rebellion again, into your own sin, into your own, oh, I got a, I got a magic Jesus card that I just pull out and I get what I want once in a while. The person who doubts, who asks and seeks the wisdom of God, but is not believing in God for is not believing in Jesus, is not seeking Christ, is not seeking true relationship and, and, and guidance from the Lord, but just wants a way out and goes like, oh God, what do I do? You know, it's like the joke, like as long as there are tests in schools, there will always be prayer in schools. Like, well, yeah, probably, but also like that doesn't make everybody a Christian just because they got so hyped up and despair. Now, some people do, they go, I need Jesus and they pray and God shows up and then they're like, all right, yeah, I'm into Jesus, man. Like that was, and they recognize it not for the like, hey, he came through and I wanted a fancy thing. But the reason they turn and stick around is they see beyond that to my heavenly father cared enough to show up in that moment. I want to know him so much more. I want to see what it looks like 
to be in relationship with him, to know him, to be loved by him, and to spend my life loving and serving him. And that's a beautiful thing when that happens. But for those who just want the next miracle on call, Jesus is not Netflix. You don't just get the next on-demand thing. That person who treats Jesus like Netflix, just skip intro, next, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do because they're not here for Jesus. There's not a stable faith that's being built. They're just here to reach out to whatever seems like it might work in any moment. They're just grasping like this. And one time Jesus showed up and they're like, oh, okay, we'll go back to that one a couple of times. But they're not really, as soon as Jesus doesn't show up, they're off to the next thing. Look, call on Buddha or you know uh, the Muslim version of Allah or whatever else. And they're not interested in actually knowing Jesus, the one who saved them. So still with this in mind, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. I thought pride was a bad thing. It is. But you should rejoice and take glory in your humble position. If you don't have anything, man, I, like, I can't wait until we do mission trips. Maybe this year. We'll see. Um, I can't wait until we do mission ch- mission trips as a church. Um, and uh, But I will say right now, and I'll say it again and again and again and again, and I'll say it while we're there and whatever else. I, I had a conversation with a dad who wanted me to bring his kids on a mission trip. And he was like, I really want to send them because I want them to get some perspective and feel better, you know, like recognize how much they have. And I was like, that is such a like diminishing and dehumanizing way to go on a mission trip. Let me go see these poor people so I can feel good about myself. I want to go see poverty so I can recognize that I don't live in poverty. Now there's some valid perspective in recognizing that. And at the same time, there's a weirdness there because like, yeah, I can go do that and come back, but that doesn't mean all my bills are suddenly paid just because like I saw somebody who's more poor than I am. That doesn't mean that suddenly every financial issue that I might have here is not an issue anymore or not a problem. It doesn't mean that all of my out, outgo, uh, you know, for all of my expenses in my life suddenly come out lower than my income. That can still be a problem even here. There's plenty of people. That's why we support an organization that is, exists solely to help people fish. We, it, it exists to help those who are under-resourced, even all the way down to, you know, they have homeless and rehabilitation and, and uh, halfway homes for people coming out of jail and prison. Because we recognize that, like, yeah, America is a rich country, and at the same time, there is poverty and hardship here as well. When we go somewhere else, my goal for you, if we go to the most poor, poverty-stricken ghetto neighborhood that we can find. I can't wait for those who come with us to experience the joy of believers who have nothing but Christ and they worship him harder than you ever thought of doing. And it is a challenge, if you're willing to see it, it is a challenge to your faith to recognize like, man, How often do I sit here and praise God with joy because something went well in my life? And then I see this person who literally has nothing praising God like I have never been willing to. Dancing before the Lord like David danced, just crying open, just they got nothing else. But they have God and they rejoice and that take pride in your high position that you have nothing in the way of fooling you into thinking that there is some qualification in your own life that has tricked you into believing that you have earned your salvation. No, you look at that and go, it is nothing but Jesus. I got nothing. Obviously, it's nothing but him. And then James turns it around and says the reverse of that is true. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation. Look at that and go, like, if you think you have a lot or you want somebody else to have a lot, you come with me and we will go to places outside of Tijuana where there's a shanty town between Tijuana and Tecate. And we will go and see places where homes with children in them are four corrugated roofing panels tied together with string and wire 
with a plastic roof that leaks with no plumbing, no electricity, no water, and see the joy and shock on people's faces when you bring them free water. And see those people love and praise God like you wouldn't believe and recognize the humiliation of, wow, and all my stuff, I don't even give God thanks for everything I have. When was the last time you praised God because you turned on the faucet and it was drinkable? We should take pride in our humiliation since they will pass away. He's talking about all the riches and the things of this world, even us, like none of our human power, wealth, anything. You can't take it with you. It's gonna fade away. It's gonna die out. Every rich person back in history, like their legacy does not endure except that we talk about them, usually because they were horrible. Um, but we just talk about things that they did. The sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. It's gonna happen to the rich and all of their stuff too. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having, un having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That doesn't mean you're literally gonna get a crown. We won't have a crowning ceremony in here. He's talking about this award, this authority and, and, and reward and award of, uh, of um, status and authority. We get to inherit the kingdom alongside Christ and that crown of eternal life. It comes as those who believe in him, as we persevere even under trial. And even more, uh, I'll tell you what, your testimony means a lot more when life is hard and you follow Jesus than it does when you, you know, sit there. If Jeff Bezos sits around and he's like, look, I'm just blessed because I follow the Lord, man. Like, yeah, that testimony doesn't really hold that much weight. Like, I'm not impressed by that one, but man, Johnny Erickson Tata, a lady who did was in a wheelchair for decades serving the Lord and, and then using that as a way to recognize like, hey, you know, we could, they did like mobile missions where they, they did wheelchair mobility, you know, these off-road wheelchairs all over the world and all this stuff and an incredible testimony, incredible uh, ministry, an incredible faith in that woman. Her testimony is, is powerful because of the way she trusted God, even in a life-altering circumstance and ongoing uh, pain and difficulty because of that. When tempted, and so this is gonna bring us uh, to the end, and, and this is gonna um, be where we're gonna uh, focus in and, and consider life uh, <laughs> as we lean into communion, as we prepare our hearts for communion. All of this so far, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, when you face temptation to turn away, when you face hard things that would distract you from or call your attention and desire toward finding an easy way out. Consider it joy and pursue the Lord and seek God for wisdom in what to do and how to manage it. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. When you're looking for it and you're going like, well, one way out is I could start dealing drugs. I can do that. Like meth is pretty, you know, quick cash. I think that's what I saw in Breaking Bad. I'm pretty sure I could do that. I can cook blue plates of crystal stuff. Pretty sure I can make sugar cookies. I think it's the same thing. That's not, that's not true. And you shouldn't go, well, God gave me that idea. No, he for sure did not. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. It's awesome that we're reading Job right now as we're starting this, because you see, even in all the things that are happening to Job, God allowed it, but he didn't cause it. And he didn't sit there and go like, hey, Job, what else might turn you away from me? Come on, do it, do it. Turn away from me. Let's try it. God is not tempting you to sin. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. We, we have this, this sin cycle of temptation and sin, and this literally fits like everything we do ever. 
It starts with temptation. There's things that we want. There's a situation that we want something better in, whether it's you're feeling bad about yourself and you're looking for some way to cope with it, whether you're looking at your difficult circumstances where you're looking at, maybe you're looking at your checkbook and you're going like, I don't know how the bank number here and the bills that are pending are going to line up. What can we do? You know what we could do? We could go, I saw, you know, like the neighbor had a pretty nice stereo system go into the house at Christmas. I bet, you know, they're not home all day. We could go figure that out. That is not the Lord providing a way for you to deal with your financial issues. Like suddenly I realized I could rob a bank. No. When you are feeling down, whether it's because of real loss or, or grief, whether it's because of, uh, of difficult circumstances or brokenness in your life or the lives and relationships around you, looking for cheap ways to fix it, trying to get drunk so you forget about it, trying to get high so you don't have to think about it, try, trying to pursue um, you know, ungodly relationships and, uh, and lust and, and all of these things so that you can have moments of pleasure that'll make you feel better for a minute. Those things are not from the Lord. Those are not the way to do it. And when those temptations enter your head, if you allow that to entice you, to draw you in, to, to become preoccupied with it, if you begin focusing and dwelling on it, temptation will hit. Jesus was tempted. There are ways, and literally, like that's the first thing Satan says, right? Like the whole, the whole temptation there is like, let me provide for you a shortcut, a way out of what you're currently going through. You've been fasting for 40 days. Why don't you turn this rock into bread? If you're really the son of God, like you can pull that off, right? And he's like, I'm here fasting to draw near to God, to turn a rock into bread and consume that would be the opposite of what I'm doing right now. It would be shortcutting this whole process of turning to the Lord and sacrificing my own well-being and comfort for God so that I can draw near to him. That would be the, the exact, that would be rejecting the presence and power of God in my life. If we get preoccupied with that idea and, and get stuck into it, the desire, it, it's like conception. It, it, it's like forming, and now you have something growing, like that desire, it's now being dwelt on and grown and fed. And, and it, um, there, there, I have it in the notes here, a little more detailed thing. It becomes ritualization where we start processing how we might do this and, and getting focused on that. And then that leads to birth. That leads to sin. That leads to acting out those desires. Up until that point, I think probably in the desire and conception part, we're, we're in sin somewhat because we're starting to really turn toward it. But acting out on it leads to death. And what death looks like is ultimately, literally death forever. You will not have eternal life, but die. If you turn away from God, reject him and, have, and pursue sin. But on the other side of it, right now, on this side of our physical death, shame brings death. Shame keeps us from God, keeps us from turning back to him. Anybody ever struggled with a habitual sin? You do it again and you just like cannot get your eyes off the ground and you're just stuck on like, you're staring at your sin, you're staring at everything you did wrong, you're looking at all that stuff and you're just so focused on that, you can't even think about looking back up at Jesus. You're like, he won't accept me right now. Like, I can't look at him. He knows what I did. You kidding me? I can't look at it. Here's the thing. Newsflash, he knows what you did. He doesn't figure it out just because you made eye contact. He knows. He knows exactly what happened. He even knows the thoughts that were going on in your head. He's sitting there going like, stop ignoring me. Listen to me. Don't do this. And shame leads to pain leads to isolation, leads to more sorrow and suffering, which then leads us to look for more shut, shortcuts to get out of it. If we will not turn to God, we continue turning to those other things and it becomes a downward spiral that resembles more of a toilet flush than anything else in our lives. And it leads us down into the sewers of depravity and rejecting and abandoning our salvation and turning away from our Lord. It brings death in our lives. As we start this year, 
I think one of the most powerful things any of us can do at any point in our life, but just, hey, it's new year, new resolutions. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus at all times. I had a Bible professor that talked about that his, he was fully convinced that after decades of following Jesus and studying the scriptures and teaching the word and all of this, he said, he said, spiritual maturity is, is so evident in how we handle temptation and sin. Repentance is a key element of dealing with sin in our lives, but it's not just about repentance after we've sinned. He said, if we get in the habit of turning to God, if we get in the habit of rejecting shame, as we become more mature, as we continually reinforce the idea that the grace of God is sufficient for us, even when we sin, then what we start finding is, I sinned, I repented and turned to God, and and that's what repentance is. Repentance is, I'm facing this way, I'm looking at my sin, I'm looking at my shame, and I turn away from all of that, and I turn back to my Lord and Savior, I turn back to the cross, I turn back toward the only one who can save me and truly deliver me from this. And I look to him and now I go, oh, I don't need any of that stuff. And also the shame goes away too because the devil's got nothing on me if Jesus already knows about it. Because when it comes to the actual condemnation, when it comes to the judging of what I've done and Satan goes, here's what Brian did. Can you believe it? And Jesus is like, oh yeah. Look next to the, look at the other end of the ledger. You have all these massive debts of sin and look what's there. My name on every single one of them. I paid for this. It's covered. I already knew about all of that. Show me something I don't know. You can't. Jesus is our advocate. The one who paid it all. The one who was and is and is to come. What have you done that he doesn't know about? And what have you done that Satan could bring up that Jesus doesn't know about and didn't already pay for? What thing could Satan bring against you that Jesus can't cover? If we turn away from our sin and shame, we break that cycle. And that comes through a commitment to repent, to turn to Christ, to receive his grace, both from him directly and from the community of believers. I'm not going to read this whole passage that's in here, but in Romans 2, he says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. That judgment does not mean saying that something somebody did is wrong. That is a weird myth of our current uh, culture that wants to claim that every time a Christian says that wasn't okay or I disagree with that, you're being judgmental, and then they will cancel you because they're not being judgmental, they're just being tolerant. Um, But if you say something's wrong, you're being judgmental, and that's wrong, which is hypocritical. Okay, Um, it doesn't make sense. Don't bring logic into it. Um, What he's saying is if we look at somebody... And we say, oh, Brian, you sinned? How dare you? Gross. You're the worst. No longer saved. You can't even be part of the church anymore. That's judgment. Removing the opportunity for forgiveness and salvation. Like, one, that's not, that's not our job to offer. It's our job to come alongside and walk people through. Now, if people are unrepentant and they just want to walk in their sin, it gets corrosive to others. There's a, an unrepentant sin, Paul in 1 Corinthians says, you know what? That guy, he's doing some horrible things. Read 1 Corinthians 5 if you want details. He's like, that guy's doing some pretty horrible stuff and you guys are rejoicing in the grace that you have. That's not grace. Grace leads leads to repentance. You, I don't know what you're doing. Send that guy out. If he's not gonna turn away from his sin, cast him out because he doesn't wanna be part of this and all it's going to do is start corrupting everybody else. It's like, man, I just had to throw out so many blueberries because I I grabbed a blueberry. We had a big thing of blueberries and I grabbed one out or a little like mini handful out and I pulled it out and there was like a moldy one and then the more I started picking at it, like all of them were mushy and moldy and like it spreads all the way through. You get one bad apple, you know, one bad apple spoils a bunch. Like that's because if you have a pile of apples and one of them's bad, all of a sudden the gases that's giving off literally do corrupt the rest of them. That will happen in, uh, with us as well. And so if somebody rejects uh, offers of grace, rejects because grace leads to repentance, 
you give grace and they're just like, sweet, free pass, doing it again. Thanks. Nope. You keep doing that and you don't want to turn away from it. Like, I'm sorry, at some point you got to be cut off. Paul says, literally turn them over to Satan and see if that gets him. Maybe that will lead back to his salvation. If you won't repent, then go live in the world and figure out that that doesn't work and then come back when you're ready to turn to Jesus. Now that we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth, Romans 2 verse 3. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? If you're going to condemn and remove the sacrifice of Christ from other people, you're going to suffer the same thing. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? 1 Corinthians 10, he, Paul, again, doubles down on this and says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. How many of us have heard the twisting of that, that God will never give you more than you can handle? That is not what the Bible says. It's an unbiblical nonsense thing that makes you feel like, you know, God saves his toughest battles for his strongest soldiers. So yoked. Like, no. Hum humiliate yourself. <laughs> Be humiliated. Be humble. Turn to the Lord. He will get you through it. And he won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear, meaning there is no temptation where you are justified in embracing your sin. No matter what it is you are facing, turn to Christ. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card. Or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.